sister. That's what I thought. His two yeah. sisters marry him. Right? Yeah. yeah. So I thought, well, that's. They got something to do with that. <laughs> yes. You're right. You're trained well. You caught the error. Oh. Yeah. Just, just sisters. I'm sure he had one. Yeah. <laughs> he did have one. You <laughs> think? Again, we'll celebrate All Saints Day, so our readings will be from the All Saints Day readings. The first one's from Revelation chapter 7. It skips around a bit, so Jack, do you want to read that one for us? I, John, saw another angel come up from the east, holding the seal of the living God. He cried out in a loud voice to the four angels who were given power to damage the land and the sea. Do not damage the land or the sea or the trees until we put the seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. I heard the, the number of those who had been marked with the seal, 144,000 marked from every tribe of the children of Israel. After this, I saw a vision of a great multitude which no one could count from every nation, race, people and tongue. They stood before the throne and before the Lamb, wearing ro white robes and holding palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, Salvation comes from our God, who is seated in the throne, and from the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and around the elders and the four living creatures. They prostrated themselves before the throne, worshiping, worshiped God and exclaimed, Amen, blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor, power and might, be to our God forever and ever, amen. Then one of the elders spoke up and said to me, Who are these wearing white robes and where did they come from? I said to him, my Lord, you are the one who knows. He said to me, These are the ones who have survived the time of great distress. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. There's a lot of things packed in there. We'll look at a couple, a couple of them there. Uh, first of all, Revelation, um, remember it starts with letters to the seven churches. So St. John's the last of the apostles alive. And there's a beautiful movie about that, and they show how integral he was to the Christians. They were excited. A letter from John, we just got one. They were reading those letters. He was in exile here on the island of Patmos, perhaps working in a salt mine or something like that. They showed him in the movie. Uh, he was doing scribe work for them, like recording numbers of salt produced or whatever, something like that. But he was in exile, we know that much, very old. And so he writes encouraging the churches. He uh, has those wonderful letters to them saying, do this, avoid that. But after that, he has his vision. Uh, he said, on the Lord's Day, so it's Sunday, he has this vision, um, and he, he sees into heaven, and he sees the heavenly worship going on. And so this really is the blueprint for the Mass, uh, just like the Jewish people knew their temple is a copy of the heavenly temple, is how they understood it. Of course, it's not a physical temple in heaven, but they mean the worship that angels give to God, right? We uh, take part in that too. So I was reflecting, I was in St. Bernard Church the other day, just looking at the artwork and everything, and it struck me even 
more how much we imitate Revelation right there. So it's chapter 4 and 5 to describe what it looks like. They said um, at the center there is a throne, which is also an altar. There's a lamb that looks like he's slain on the altar. So the front of our altar, what's it have? It has the lamb with the seven seals, right, from Revelation. He'll get that later. He'll receive the scroll from the Father. It says that around that there's four living creatures. Uh, we have those four candles right near the, our altar. Many uh, altars do that too. Of course, those are the four gospel writers, the four evangelists. We have those back in the apps now too. The four living creatures are back there again in painting form. Uh, then it talks about there are the white-robed elders, who symbolize like the apostles, uh, priests. And in the ancient church, they would have the bishop would be at the mass, and the priests were around him like in a semicircle in the back part of the church. Uh, as a result, that's how they worshipped um, right there. Uh, so we have the right-robed uh, servants, so the priest is there, the servers helping him out. Uh, then it talks about a great multitude of all creatures of heaven and earth praising God. And looking up, I saw, of course, the stars are there, right, in our, our ceiling now. There's angels there. There's symbols of vines and, like, living things you know, all around us. The idea is all creation is worshiping God. And even it says, below the feet of the king, elsewhere it mentions this, it was a sea like of glass. I looked down, there's the blue carpet we have, like a sea. You know, I was like, wow, it's pretty cool. So it's idea, like I said in the homily today, it's like we take a snapshot of all creation. That's what the church is. It's showing us like a still life of this is what it's all supposed to be. All things are worshiping God if we could just see it. And we're part of that worship too. And, of course, that wonderful new Jerusalem we have for our high altar. It's all golden. There's even rooftops in that high altar and little fire, little houses for the saints. You know, it's really cool. And it said the lamb is at the center of that city. And there's the tabernacle in the middle. So it's really astounding. I just, just was struck by that of how it, it much it mimics Revelation. You know, it really does that. Of course, all masses and all churches are patterned after that. But ours is made very apparent by all the artwork and, and things we have right there. So really, St. John is seeing the worship of God, the heavenly liturgy. And then after that, his vision unfolds with those different sevens, like seven trumpets, seven bowls of the end times occurring. He describes many things. And it's super complex because he doesn't really go chronologically exactly. He kind of gives greater detail about some parts of it. You know, there's seven of these things, and the last part has seven more, and he describes all the different things going on. So it's super complicated. But the goal is he wants to show us, again, how God triumphs over evil and how God will help us through adversity. He speaks about all that. So we have that here. We have these people who are worshiping God. Uh, so we have this angel uh, given the power to, uh, it says, to damage land and the sea. He says, don't damage them yet. So we put this seal on the foreheads. I always think of the sacraments when I hear the word seal, uh, like confirmation, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. The bishop says, you know, and the um, catechism mentions we receive an indelible mark on our souls at baptism, confirmation, and ordination too. So it's something that changes us forever. Uh, so I think of seal it refers to the sacraments, right? We're sealed, we're marked with these signs of the living God. There's 144,000. I brought out little apologetics here. This is this uh, San Juan Catholic seminars, very good apologetics. This is about Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons, how to respond to them. Because you probably heard the 144,000 before, right? You heard about that? That's all who will get to heaven. So this describes it a bit there. Jehovah's Witnesses, they say only 144,000 go to heaven. They say, well, it says right there, 144,000, that's all that will ever go to heaven in all history of the world, they say. Uh, they call them the anointed, it says right here. Um, they say it began with the apostles and completed by 1935. So no one else can go to heaven in their understanding. They talk about there is like a earthly paradise is all we got left. We can't go to heaven though. It's very interesting. Um, and so they mention that there the Old Testament saints will inherit only earthly paradise. They could not enter heaven before Christ died. Uh, they call dwells of earthly paradise the other sheep. That's how they consider it. Um, it's very unique to them. No one else has done this before. It's uh, just an invention of Jehovah Witnesses. There's no historical record prior to 1935 when it was given to Russell's successor, uh, Judge Joseph Rutherford. He had a revelation he said about this. And they give that same section we just read. And we skipped some of the uh, repetitiveness. Uh, St. John drives it home. He says there were 12,000 of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 of Gad, etc. Each of the 12 tribes of Israel has 12,000. Um, they mention this here. Give a bit there. Skip the next page. Talks a bit about this. Um, now, if you go on, it says more about them. Taken literally, uh, these are celibate Jewish males. It mentions that. Um, so if you take it figuratively, it's symbolic, of course, 144,000. If you take it literally, it means only 
celibate Jewish males are going to go to heaven, which isn't well, what Christ says elsewhere, you know, right? So they want to say, well, it's only this many. Well, that means it's also only celibate Jewish males who go to heaven, which they don't mean that because they're not <laughs> celibate Jewish males. So you have to take it figuratively, of course. Um, and there's no such basis for that interpretation they mentioned there. Um, and they, aren't, they themselves aren't divided into tribes. They mention that too. They mention all the tribes of Israel. Hobo's witnesses don't divide themselves into tribes either. They mention that too. Um, and they mention uh, also too, they mention the bottom 144,000 are on earth. They're not in heaven. It mentions there, I saw these people on the earth. Right, They're marked with the seal while they're still on the earth. So you can't interpret it that way. Um, there's no division of earthly paradise or heavenly paradise. They mentioned some of those those elements right there. Um, and of course, we look after this passage. Uh, it says, Then I saw a great multitude, and they're all obviously a part of the elect as well. Um, they are singing to God. They praise him. They have these white robes. They've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. So it seems these are the ones um, who are saved, right? They're washed in Christ's blood. Of course, those are the martyrs, those who've been uh, suffered for the Lord. Um, and also those who receive the sacraments, too, are washed in Christ's blood. Um, so again, that's a, a very strange interpretation that developed in 1935, um, and they give us some examples of how that doesn't really square with Scripture, how it's not found anywhere else either, you know. Um, but instead, what's this, what could this number mean? Well, again, a thousand is a number of, like, fullness or perfection, and we have, again, the 12 tribes. So there's 12,000 of each tribe. So again, the fullness of uh, God's holy people will be realized. You know, so it could refer, as St. Paul mentions in his writings, to his own people being saved. He was concerned for uh, his, the Jewish people accepting that Jesus was Savior. He said, well, first it must go to the Gentiles now, and then they will be saved later. They'll accept Christ as Savior. So it could refer to that, of uh, the people of the Jewish faith who accepted Christ. And there are many, of course, who have. Um, but it could just refer to the new uh, Israel, God making us into his new chosen people. It could refer to that as well. And again, the seal, like we say, could refer to baptism, the sacraments, a confirmation we receive who imprints us. And of course, the forehead is used too, right? We use it for confirmation. That could refer to that as well. Um, and I like this too. They mentioned this great multitude who are washed in Christ's blood, who are purified by the blood of the Lamb from every nation, race, people, and tongue. So all the earth now. So this, again, we see this uh, contrast, the, Gen the Jews being saved, now the Gentiles too. And that was the theme of the old, of uh, the, uh, Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles, first the chosen people are given the chance to accept Christ, then the message goes to the Gentiles and they accept it. And St. Paul did the same thing in his ministry. So it seems like this is the church, both together. Both the, the Jewish people who first heard the word of God, then those who accepted Christ, and all the Gentiles who then hear it after that. So it's really a vision of the church, it looks like to me. Um, and you saw again the angels around the throne, the elders and four living creatures. Those are those parts of the heavenly liturgy we talked about there too. So that's some of the deeper background behind this, what's going on. A couple, like, there's a lot, a lot happening right here. How about just some phrases you like or some, some thoughts that sparks in you hearing these things? I like this, the songs they sing, I think, are really beautiful. Again, the four uh, elders, elders prostrate themselves, they bow before God, worship him. They say, Amen, which is yes, so be it. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor, power, and light. Be to our God forever and ever. What a beautiful prayer. I like that prayer a lot there. I think, too, the Lamb of God, St. John calls him the Lamb. That was a big theme in his gospel when uh, he was with it was probably St. John and Andrew, who were uh, disciples of John the Baptist. He says, Behold the Lamb of God. So they hear Christ call that right away, so then they follow him there. So St. John emphasizes the Lamb quite a lot in his writings. That's a cool parallel to see. I like how the angels are involved, too. We always see them, especially in Revelation, part of helping... Uh, us to worship God, of protecting God's faithful. Here they mark those uh, who are servants of God. Well, it's pretty meaningful to be washed, to be made white in the blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. 
it's a funny uh, contrast that washing something in blood doesn't make it white. You know, that makes it really stained, as you know. But here, that blood does wash white. It's the funny thing. And even uh, the early Christians, they used to say when someone was martyred, when they were killed in the arena or by the soldiers, they would say, washed and saved. They used to say that when the per as the person died, say, washed and saved. They're washed in the blood of the Lamb. They understood this to mean martyrs, too. And I find some hope here, too. It says they have survived the time of great distress. We think sometimes well, they were killed, they didn't survive it, right? But he's saying, no, 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 this is what matters. They've survived for eternal life. But also, again, there, there was a second group um, besides martyrs called confessors in the ancient church. They were beat up for Jesus, but they weren't killed. Like Some of them, they were like manhandled by soldiers. They tried to kill him and didn't manage to. So they called them confessors because they, they would have died for Christ, but they weren't killed. They, they didn't, the enemies didn't manage to kill them. They were still respected. They called them confessors. Um, so it could refer to that as well. I think martyrs especially we hear uh, as uh, calls to our mind for this passage. All right, well, Psalm 24 is our psalm for this week. Interesting choice. And this one is a neat one about kind of approaching God's temple. And it fits, I think, well with uh, Revelation about approaching the heavenly temple. How do we worship God? We imitate what the angels do. As I mentioned in Psalm 24, this first six verses at least, that the lords of the earth and its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it, you founded it upon the seas, established it upon the rivers. Who can ascend the mountain of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? One whose hands are sinless, whose heart is clean, who desires not what is vain. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord, a reward from God his Savior. Such is the race that seeks him, that seeks the face of the God of Jacob. The psalm goes on to say, O gates, lift higher heads, grow higher ancient doors. It's like a response back and forth of pilgrims going to the temple, and they would respond to maybe the people at the gates. They would say, Who is the Lord? He is the King of glory. They go back and forth. It's a pretty fun, uh, fun psalm they would sing. Um, and I think, again, this fits with Revelation very well mentions those who have, whose hands are sinless, whose heart is clean, those who have been washed in the blood of Christ and renewed by the sacraments, they can approach God to worship. Uh, the mountain of God kind of calls to mind the, uh, the heavenly worship in, in heaven, how the angels are worshiping God in Revelation. And again, how all creation worships the Lord, or it's the earth and its fullness. All things are part of giving their worship to God. Any other thoughts from the psalm here? Seeking God's face, too, that's a neat way to put it. Going more uh, intimate with God in prayer. Uh, Moses talked about that. I want to see your face, O Lord. He said that a couple times in his prayers. So we, too, can look upon the face of God. Of course, in Jesus Christ, we really can. You know, the divine mercy and uh, sacred heart images remind us the face of Christ is there. How about 1 John? So still in the tradition of St. John. That's our second reading, the first letter of St. John. It's a tiny part, chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. It's very small. And I think in your, uh, in your Bibles there, it's in the very corner of the page, too, at the end of that page. And so again, these letters of St. John, there's, uh, he, uh, they're very short. This is the longest one, 1 John. He's giving instructions to his different churches that he had charge over clarifying some things. And he mentions he doesn't give uh, the Beatitudes in his gospel and St. John's gospel. So it seems there was an error. They perhaps didn't think they had to keep the commandments. So he says, oh no, you still have to keep the commandments. So he emphasizes that in his letters. We have a different uh, selection here, though. I'd like to read that John 1 <coughs> John uh, chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. See what love the Father has bestowed on us, that we may be called the children of God. Yet so we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. 
we do not know that when it is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope based on him makes himself pure as he is pure. In other words, we do not, we do, we know do know that. Yep. <laughs> I think about that the world it did not know him did not know Jesus and that's not just like a thing in the past it's it's even now you know the world does not know Jesus and you find that it's it's really it's even more strange when the certain movies or books try to talk about Jesus because they can't do it they have to make him into this or make him into that you know like every life of Christ they see or on the movies it's just well, he's a revolutionary, or he's a good teacher, he's a nice guy. They can't really, they don't get Jesus, you know, because they don't know him. They don't pray to him, they don't ask for his help. So there's still the world does not know Jesus. And so, of course, doesn't know those who follow him either. I think it's like a, it's a perennial problem, not, not knowing Jesus. And we can fall prey to that, too, if we don't, um, you know, talk to him in prayer. That's how we know, we know Jesus, by uh, having a relationship with him, by knowing him. shall be <clears throat> has not yet been revealed. Of course, in All Saints, we're thinking about the, the elect who are in heaven now, the future resurrection. So it's, a, it's a, an amazing thing we can't even think about yet, how, how good that's going to be. So we know we're his children now, but something even greater awaits us in the future. So we'll be like God, we'll see him as he is. So be, the saints would call that the beatific vision, the happy vision of God. I'll have all blessedness and joy to see the Lord face to face. the end is St. John's encouragement. He says, everyone who has this hope based on him makes himself pure as he is pure. He's saying to avoid sin, to grow in holiness, that um, uh, we have this great hope for uh, for glory that God has promised us so we have to grow more and more like him. We have to leave sin behind to become converted. He's encouraging his people to do that and also us too. to again children that's another relationship word right so we have to stay in relationship with God or we're going to not get it we're not going to not understand what Christ is doing in my life why are you doing this to me Jesus and even the saints are confused sometimes but they keep having that relationship with him keep asking him like what's next Lord what do I do next and that keeping that relationship up is really key because we are children we can't just uh, be a child with no relationship with parents we have to have some adult in our life some guiding figure so the same is true that be in relationship with God always talking to him asking for his help. How about our gospel? That is Matthew 5. The Beatitudes. The key passage here. So it's uh, <coughs> chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. This begins the Sermon on the Mount of Matthew's gospel, which is chapters 5 through 7. It's one of the five major uh, speeches or teachings that Christ gives. Where St. Matthew, um, writing to a Jewish audience, Jewish Christians, so he emphasizes Christ as the new Moses. He's on the top of a mountain. Moses gave the commandments from a mountain. And so Christ gives the new law from a mountaintop here. <clears throat> and there's five times Jesus gives a, a teaching. It's like there are five books to, in the Jewish law. And Christ is fulfilling the law here. I'd like to read that part. So Matthew 5, verses 1 to 12. When he saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. He began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger, and thirst for the righteousness, 
so blessed are um, uh, holy, um, joyful are those who have these attitudes here, who, who behave in this way. Um, there was a cool window I saw which had <coughs> the Beatitudes, uh, different windows in the church, had a saint for each one of them. I was trying to match up certain saints that have this in a special way. Whereas poor in spirit, St. Francis of Assisi, that's a pretty easy one. Those who mourn, I was thinking maybe St. Monica. She was worried for her son for how many years? 30 years before he got it back together. The meek, uh, I think maybe there's quite a few of those. And even St. Thomas Aquinas, they um, thought he was a fool because he wouldn't. He was very quiet and humble. They thought he didn't get his studies. He was actually the, the smartest one in the whole class, you know. Those who hunger for righteousness. I'm not clear those who like saw great conversion, perhaps. Um, may the saints who fasted at great fasts, um, uh, maybe St. Anthony of the desert who went far away to pray, just to be close to God, <clears throat> the merciful, and well, St. John Paul II forgave his would-be killer, right? The guy shot him, he went and forgave him in prison. There's a lot of examples of that, those who are merciful to their, um, their attackers even. The clean of heart, they will see God, some of the holy, um, uh, holy virgins, especially uh, young martyrs, uh, St. Dominic Savio, I think of him. He never committed a serious sin his whole life. He died when he was 14. St. John Bosco was his, his uh, teacher. He's a very pure. St. Maria Goretti as well, dying for purity. Uh, peacemakers. I think Elizabeth of Portugal is what I'm thinking of. She, her sons were fighting in a different kingdom. They were fighting. She brought peace to their, their land, the war they were making there. Or Pope Leo the Great, I think of him. He stopped until the Hun from destroying Europe. Uh, and persecuted, of course, a lot of, a lot of saints are persecuted for righteousness. Those who are even misunderstood by their own people. It speaks about that too, those who are falsely accused. Many saints suffered those kind of uh, slanders a lot in their life. A lot of those come to mind. Um, and these, uh, the Beatitudes, remember, are like, uh, they kind of perfect uh, the Ten Commandments. Like brings to how do we really live them from the heart? We have these attitudes here. We won't murder someone if we're merciful, or if we're meek. You know, we won't um, worship false gods if we're seeking for righteousness, uh, if we're true peacemakers, clean of heart. So they kind of Christ wants to, and you see later in that same sermon here on the mount, he mentions you heard it said, don't kill. I say don't hate. You heard it said, don't commit adultery. I say don't lust. So he goes to the motivation, saying you got to have those. That's where it comes from. I guess what makes a saint a saint is someone who's uh, been renewed inside. They don't desire uh, sin. They desire to, to live against sin, to live in freedom. And since it is All Saints Day, we're thinking about those saints especially who uh, even aren't named. Who, who are, there's, there's many, um, as Revelation says, a great multitude of the saved. We don't all know their names, right? Because there's many. You see some of the saints, they say, uh, saying so-and-so and his companions or her companions. They were a bunch of people killed together, like in Japan or Korea. And we don't know their names, but we know they're saints because they, they suffered for Jesus. Um, I gave a brief reflection on the back of this handout from the Catechism. But what exactly is a saint? You know, what do they do? What are they about? It mentions those three states of the church, how even uh, death cannot separate us from those who are baptized. Um, it mentions here we have... Uh, there are the saints in glory with the angels. At the present time, some are pilgrims on earth, that's us. Others have died or are being purified, that's the souls in purgatory. Those who are being uh, cleansed of their attachment to sin. That speaks about a bit here. Then it mentions um, uh, we're one in Christ here. Then also 956 in the Catechism mentions intercession of saints. So why are the saints, uh, why are they good to ask for their help? What do they do for us? They are more closely united to Christ. Those who dwell in heaven fix the whole church more firmly in holiness. They do not cease to intercede with the Father for us, as they proffer or offer the merits which they acquired on earth, the one mediator between God and men, Christ Jesus. So by their fraternal concern is our weakness greatly helped. So they're always uh, helping us. And we're in communion with the saints they mention here. It's not merely by the title of example we cherish their memory. We seek that by this devotion to the exercise of fraternal charity, our bond of love with them, the union of the whole church in the spirit may be strengthened. So we're made stronger by being one with them. And Revelation again makes it very clear. They're worshiping God in heaven. We're worshiping Him on earth. 
We're all one chorus of praise, raising things up to God. Uh, the saints are examples for us in one thing, but also they're all they're really helping us all the time, always interceding for us. And again, God chooses to, to have people cooperate in this plan to save the whole world. The saints do that, they cooperate in that plan. So God chooses to need us. He chooses to need us and to use angels. Uh, he doesn't have to, but he wants things to work that way so we can all have a, have a share. I think it was Dr. Edward Shree mentioned the other day how uh, the, what, what good is it to have... Uh, why ask angels for help or something? He says, well, and uh, Mary, he said, well, for example, like, uh, I want to bake a cake for my mom for Mother's Day. He was too young. He couldn't do it. So his dad helps him bake. He said, my dad really baked the cake. That's what really happened. He said, but I, like, it seemed like I took a part somehow in it, you know? So that's how it is with the saints is we, we try to do these things, and they really help us make it happen so we can make a good offering to, uh, to God, you know? So we don't, we, sometimes we can't do very much, but they, their power works through us, so they help us to, to accomplish that. So we're still a part of it. We can still do our part as we're able, but they, their power can accomplish so much more. You know, as a fun reflection, I thought of the saints' help for us. So, any thoughts about saints or your favorite saints? Uh, these beatitudes really strike you. This is why I love the song "Be Not Afraid" so much because there is such a a play on the Beatitudes in that song. Yeah, definitely. Blessed are your poor, the kingdom shall be theirs. As it mentions that in one verse. Blessed are those, blessed are you, if they insult you. Yeah. And persecute you. And say bad things about you. Yeah. <laughs> blessed, blessed are you. probably the hardest one. I think you're blessed if you're persecuted or if bad things said about you. It seems like yeah. If it seems like everybody hates you. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, wow. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Circus being hated for Christ, not for your own fault, you know. <laughs> it's hard. But that's the trick, though. Usually, like, uh, even the saints, people try to raise up from the fault that's not really there. It's not really a fault. They try to say, well, you're arrogant or something like that. And the person's like, well, am I really arrogant? Or Because they talk about Jesus. You know, now the thing is like, well, you're judgmental and mean. Like, well, I just said that Jesus has another way and what you're doing is a sin. Like, no, you're a mean person. But I don't think I am really, am I? You know, so we have to kind of examine ourselves or we can be questioning sometimes what we're saying or doing. But that's kind of the general attack now is, um, of course, that, that's called an ad hominem attack. You attack the person, not the message, which doesn't mean the message is wrong, you know. So people do that today. They just attack the person don't listen to the method the person proclaims. So Christians have a lot of that. You know, it's like, look, look, look at the popes. They're always someone who insults the popes, right? It's like, well, John Paul, uh, I don't like him because he's too outgoing. And well, Benedict, he's too introvert. I don't like him. And Francis, I don't like how he says things. So there's always some fault you can find with the person. doesn't mean their message is wrong, though. So it's not a good, good uh, re rebuke to their message. So that's the trick, right? It's always <laughs> making sure we're preaching Christ, man, if we're insulted. Say, well, okay, am I preaching Christ? I have my false sure. I'm not the perfect person, of course, but what are they really angry about? Are they angry at me, really, or are they angry at the message? If it's the message, just to be patient with them and to kind of suffer those attacks, you know, for a while. Like with children, we know the same. That's true, right? Like, uh, you need to clean your room. I do this. I hate you. I don't want to do it. You know, do you really hate me? No, you don't. You just hate the discipline you have to have in your life. So you've got to suffer that with children, the, their kind of anger or hostility at times. So they can really be trained in, in holiness, you know. But really, though, a lot of people don't grow up. That's how they approach life all the time, you know. Or we say, you need to turn away from the sin. Do this. I hate you. you know? No, you just hate the message because you don't want to change. So we have to kind of just suffer in silence sometimes. Uh, the, the attacks people love against us. It's interesting. There's some of that going on in the political campaigns now. Oh yeah. Uh, Donald Trump is claiming he's Presbyterian and what a great, you know, what a great thing that, that is. And uh, the other comment was uh, Latter Day Saints. Latter Day Saints is that what Carson? Yeah. Mormons. Yeah. He's Mormon. Uh, he said, I don't know about that. He didn't really say anything bad, but he brings it up, attaches yeah. it to the other candidate, and then says, well, I don't know about that. Yeah. 
but he's trying to impugn that there's something bad about it because exactly. people don't understand it. Yeah. There, yes. Right? That's not really there. It may it may not be there at all, and it may not be true at all. But he he's he's a master at doing that. Yeah. <laughs> Planting those little seeds of. And sadly, so much of politics is just the uh, way the messages get us, not the message itself, right? That's kind of the problem we have. So it's like, what's what's he going to do as a president or a candidate? You know, we don't. Okay, whatever he thinks. He likes this movie. Who cares? You know, what's he going to do? So again, it's distracting from the issue it, that's at hand. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true with Jesus. You know, we uh, people they try to like distract us somewhere else, so they won't listen to the message we give. You know, it's, it's tricky. And we ourselves can be distracted too. Sometimes there's bad people in the church, and they go, "Oh, they're horrible. Why do they follow Jesus? That's so bad." They, well, okay, what's the? Is it Jesus or this bad person that my faith is in? You know, and I gotta focus on Christ. So even Jesus had a traitor. He had Judas. You know, he was a bad example. Um, that happens too. So the key is to focus on the message of Christ and to live it ourselves as best we can. Yeah, I'm going to just reflect at the end a bit on again, the theme of saints that kind of runs through all these readings we have. And those who, uh, Revelation shows that those who have suffered for Christ, um, those who have given witness to him, washed in the blood of the Lamb, we ourselves receive a, a share in it, baptism and confirmation. Those who approach the God to worship, the psalm mentions that. Uh, again, St. John mentions how it will be changed, be glorious. The saints are already enjoying that in heaven. And we have our hope to become purified more and more by their help, so we too can join them. And then these attitudes that Christ mentions, these ways uh, our heart can be changed, to be poor in spirit, to be meek, to seek after righteousness. The saints have all these things too, which they want us to have as well. Let's look at that kind of common theme just for a minute, just pause and, and ponder that. as children of God, let us pray that prayer to our Heavenly Father that Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. For the those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God.